for part two of our parametric modeling e-learning series. Uh, today we'll be focusing on the setup of the model in the ANSYS mechanical tool. This is Pat Cunningham. I'll be your demonstrator for today. A uh, quick note on audio, uh, and when you log into the meeting initially, uh, everyone's audio or, or speaker anyway will be muted. Uh, but if you have a question that you would like to submit, please feel free to use the chat window uh, in the um, webinar window of the, uh, of the meeting here. Uh, we'll address all questions that are presented at the end of the presentation, and we'll also open up the audio uh, for anyone that would like to ask their, their question directly. Just a quick note on CA Associates, a little background on who we are. Uh, we are an engineering consulting firm. We're located in Middlebury, Connecticut. We specialize, we specialize in both FEA and CFD analysis. Uh, we've been an ANSYS channel partner since 1985. We've been providing uh, sales of the ANSYS products as well as training and technical support for our area. This presentation is part of a series of e-learning webinars that we've been offering at CA Associates. Uh, we have many of these that we've completed already. Uh, we record each one of them as we do the presentation, and then we make those recordings available for viewing at two locations. One is on our website under the e-learning section. You'll see all of the e-learning seminars that we've completed and links <coughs> to view the recording uh, to the right of it. You can also uh, go to YouTube. We've set up a YouTube channel under CAE Associates. So simply search for CAE Associates and you'll, you'll find us. And then you'll see the list of videos. Now, these are the same videos that you'll find on the website. It uh, just gives you an alternate approach to, to finding them and viewing them. If you are with us today and you're a New Jersey or New York resident, you can earn continuing education credits by attending the full webinar. We just ask that you complete a survey, which will be emailed to you after the conclusion of the pres presentation today. Also on our website, if you've had the opportunity to check out our resource library, we're continuously uh, building uh, the content on our resource library. It, it contains things like our consulting case studies, uh, any conference or seminar presentations. If you've ever attended any of our update seminar presentations, uh, all of the presentation files are there for download and viewing. Uh, also software demonstrations such as e-learning uh, and others. And if we have any useful macros or scripts, these include both mechanical APDL scripts as well as ACT extensions that we've developed for the Workbench users out there. Uh, no cost to downloading those. If you see a particular script or ACT extension that you find useful, uh, you simply uh, log into the website and uh, download it uh, for your own usage. Also on our website, relatively new, is the ability to not only view our training calendar and look at uh, the uh, training descriptions, but also to register for classes right on the website. And you can see we have uh, uh, webinars uh, plus uh, full ANSYS training available. Uh, just work your way through our calendar and uh, see if there's any course there that you're interested in taking. If you happen to have a course in mind and you don't see it on the calendar, by all means calculate, or I'm sorry, uh, contact one of our salesmen, either Tony Salazzo or Andy Hughes, and uh, let him know about your interest in taking the class, and we can generally make something work. We've also added an Engineering Advantage blog to our website. We are putting up uh, weekly content for the engineering blog, and we'd encourage you to take a look at that, and by all means, uh, open up a discussion with the blog uh, author. Uh, there's an option underneath the blog to insert your comment, and we will certainly respond to that accordingly. Mentioned a moment ago, this webinar today is part two of a three-part series on parametric modeling. Uh, if you joined us for part one, we discussed parametric geometry, both from a uh, feature-based tool standpoint as well as a direct geometry uh, tool standpoint. Uh, that webinar was, as I mentioned, recorded and is available on the YouTube channel. Today we'll be talking about setting up the finite element model, uh, primarily in the ANSYS mechanical tool as well as the parameter set in the Workbench project. Uh, we'll be talking about how we can set up parametric inputs for materials, mesh, contact, and loads, and then setting up uh, output parameters that uh, are with respect to the results of the analysis. Uh, stay tuned because after today we'll be, we'll be developing part three where we will take the first two parts 
of this presentation and wrap that under the optimization umbrella. So we'll be looking at the Design Explorer tool as it pertains to using the setup that we've developed for this current parametric model. Just a quick review. We talk about parametric modeling. What we're talking about is an approach to doing analysis that allows us to get the most out of our finite element models. So the whole idea here is you set up your model parametrically and then you can, with just a click of a button, update your model and look at sens the sensitivity of your design to particular inputs um, to the system. So this parametric approach involves defining parameters that represent the inputs of the system, which we just discussed, and then we use output parameters to track the response with respect to changes in the input. So as I mentioned before, part one, we talked about geometric parameters as input parameters and how to deal with them uh, from two different approaches, both direct and feature-based. And again, if you're interested in uh, viewing that recording, you can find it on our website uh, or under our YouTube channel. So when we talk about input quantities for our finite element models, uh, we, can re we can categorize these uh, into uh, six basic areas. Uh, the first is material properties. So we're, we're, we're putting in uh, material coefficients for things like elastic modulus, density, coefficient of thermal expansion. You know, depending on the type of analysis that you're doing, uh, you have to supply certain material properties. Now, if those are constant properties, we can assign to them a parameter, and then we can look at our sensitivity of the design to variations in those properties. Uh, we can define uh, parametric mesh settings, which allow us to essentially define the size and shapes of the elements. We can also relate those mesh parameters to other input parameters in the system. So we may have a situation where we have a driving geometric parameter and we want to make sure that we have a consistent mesh in the region that that parameter affects. We can relate the mesh sizing parameter to the geometric parameter. We'll show you how to do that on the project page in the parameter set. There are input quantities for connections uh, between parts in an assembly, whether those are joints or contact elements. Things like the contact normal offset can be studied parametrically if you have an interference fit and you're trying to look at the effect of the stress and deformation in a region of the model based on the interference fit size. Uh, as far as loads are concerned, forces, pressures, heat flow, et cetera, these can all, the magnitudes of these values can also be made parametric. And we'll also see today that if you have things like offset loads, you can also make parametric the location of that offset load, which then represents the resulting moment on the system. We have supports that react out the loads. Now, these can often be input quantities because very often if you have something like a uh, nonlinear problem with contact, you may have a displacement-driven problem where you're specifying the displacement, and the output from that displacement would then be the reaction force required to, uh, to move the part by that amount. So supports can be uh, both output quantities and they can also, as, as non-zero displacements, be used as inputs. When we talk about output quantities, uh, we're evaluating the response of the system with respect to changes in those inputs. Uh, the most common output parameter that we use if we're building an optimization study is the system mass. We typically try to minimize on the system mass. But any result quantity for deformation, stress, strain, probe results can be tracked using the workbench parameter set. Just kind of going through these, I'd like to go through each one and show you uh, where you can find the option to assign parameters for each of these quantities, and then we'll go through a brief, a brief demonstration uh, actually setting up a problem in a similar fashion. So beginning with material coefficients, those will be found in the engineering data uh, area of your project page. So double click on engineering data, identify the material that you're using, and then identify the property of that material that you'd like to assign a parameter to. To assign that parameter, go over to column E, where you see the little symbol with the red P and the, and the uh, little flow path around it. Click on the box to the, left, uh, to, the, to the right of that particular coefficient, and you'll see it appear then in the workbench parameter set. And now you have the ability to either modify it at the parameter set level or to, in the design table, look at multiple um, assignments to that, in this case, the Young's modulus of that material. Parametric mesh controls, any sizing control that we're going to use is going to, is going to have a little box to the left of it down in the details of that particular sizing. Clicking on that box then adds that to the parameter set on the project page. We talk about load magnitudes. Anytime we're putting in either a uh, vector or a component-based load uh, as a constant value, you'll see that there's an option to click on the box to the left. Again, adding that to the parameter set as an input parameter. 
In addition to uh, the magnitude for remote type loads, remote displacements and remote forces, we can also designate offsets uh, from the specified location. So we're going to distribute some load that's being applied uh, out at this location based on another part that's attached that we don't need to model in this particular case. We're going to distribute that load onto a specified area of the model, and we can define now the location of that remote point based on some reference. And that reference is a coordinate system typically, and then we can define X, Y, Z offsets uh, to that for the location of that load with respect to the coordinate system. And as you can see on the, on the left here, the X, Y, Z offsets are also parametric. So now we can look at a sensitivity study as the load is moved in a particular direction. If you are using MAPDL command blocks or input macros to define certain types of loads or inputs into your system, uh, you can feed to that, to that command block an, a, an argument as an input value, which then can be defined as a parameter or controlled parametrically via the, the Workbench uh, project page. So a simple example here would be that I want to look at the sensitivity of my response to changes in the normal context stiffness. Now, normal context stiffness is not an item that I have in the details menu with a little box next to it that I can click. However, with a little bit of uh, APDL knowledge, uh, I can insert that command block. I can feed a value as argument one. That's going to be my value for the normal contact stiffness. And then I can overwrite the default material table for that particular contact region by using both the CID parameter that's automated for that particular uh, contact pair and then inserting my argument as that normal contact stiffness. So simply by doing this, I can rename that argument or, or redefine it. I can look at the effect of, say, stress versus the normal contact stiffness being used. For output parameters, as I mentioned before, the most common output parameter that we're going to see in an optimization study is the mass. You're going to find the mass under the details of the geometry for the system. And we'll talk about uh, the mass of individual components uh, versus uh, uh, parts in an assembly uh, in, a particular, in, in a moment or so. So simply click on that button for mass. Notice that volume is also available to, to be tracked, and that will be added to your parameter set as an output parameter. The most common result quantities that we have available, pretty much any quantity that you insert into the solution folder, will have an option for you to track the maximum or the minimum value of that quantity. And that brings up an important point, because it's very, very critical that when you're tracking output quantities for something like stress or deformation, that you specify a discrete scoped region so that you know exactly where that quantity is coming from. Uh, if you have a situation with, with say, nonlinear contact and the status is changing, the location of that maximum stress could potentially change throughout the structure. And you don't want to identify a scoped area that's so large that the value that you're tracking could be moving around. You want to be reasonably confident that that value has always been reported from the same location on the model. So output quantities, uh, result quantities, and output parameters are essentially free. There's no computational cost other than the generation of the plot. So if you can generate as many of these as possible and track as many output parameters as possible, you're going to have a better chance of characterizing what the response of the system is. It's important to note that when we're doing this type of design study and we're identifying these output parameters, all we're getting is a value for the particular design point. We're not by default getting the full contour display that would then allow us to fully interrogate that model. There is a way to do that, which we'll talk about short, shortly. But by default, we're only pulling off the max or min value for that particular result. So just make sure that you scope uh, very discreetly so that you're confident you know where that maximum uh, value is coming from. Also, uh, I always recommend that you rename your output quantities in the outline tree, because when you identify them as parameters, you'll then see the name that you specified in the parameter set. And it makes it much easier than looking at equivalent stress one, two, three, so on and so forth. If it's, if it's discreetly described, uh, you'll know exactly which parameter uh, you're evaluating. Other items, probe items are very useful. Uh, you may want to look at the force distribution through a particular area. That can be done by taking a probe from a boundary condition re uh, reaction force or by using construction geometry to uh, basically map the, the F sum or the total sum of the forces through a particular area of the model, whether that's a surface or an edge in a 2D model. So in this particular case, I placed a plane uh, halfway through the boss of my part, and I'm doing a force summation on that plane and then reporting 
uh, the, the min, ma the XYZ max, and then the total amount of force that's being distributed through that area. Again, if you're a mechanical APDL user, this is equivalent to doing an F sum on a selected set of elements. That value, again, as an as a output parameter, can be tracked and added to the parameter set. If you are in need of a result that is not included in the pull-down menus or not a standard mechanical result, you always have the option to use the user-defined result. User-defined result involves looking up uh, in the worksheet the particular expression for the quantity that you're trying to track, and then once you have that user-defined result expanded, you, you can track the minimum or maximum value. Uh, in this simple example here, I'm looking for the Epsilon X plastic strain. Uh, by default, Workbench will only give me the total von Mises plastic strain. So if I want to just pull out the X, Y, or Z, I need to find the expression. Again, just by simply clicking on the worksheet, you'll see the quantity and the expression. Place the expression here uh, in the details menu, and then identify that we want to track either the min or maximum of that value. And again, make sure you scope that accordingly. If I am using post-processing macros, to pull information from the ANSYS result file, I can pull scalar quantities using things like the star get command. Uh, let's say I wanted to, for ANSYS, ANSYS Classic users out there, there was a, an e-table item or a summable miscellaneous item or non-miscellaneous item uh, or non-summable that I wanted to pull uh, from my result file. Not something that I can generally get from Workbench, requires a, a little bit of uh, MAPDL coding, but that's okay because we can insert this command block we could feed inputs into the command block, say for instance the element number that I'd like to pull that from would be argument one, uh, and we can then filter out the, the scalar parameters that we've specified using a prefix. So in this case I used a prefix of E1 underscore, I specify that I want the output to search for that, and then add that particular quantity to the parameter set for me to track. So let's go to our example problem now. Uh, we're going to pick up where we left off with the geometry presentation uh, with our Lego Man example. Uh, in the first pre uh, part of this presentation, we looked at uh, what we could do from a geometry standpoint in terms of the redesign of Lego Man's hip joint. And now we'll take it through the paces uh, on the mechanical side. So I'm going to switch over to mechanical now. And we'll start by identifying the input parameters. Well, as we mentioned before, uh, if we want to specify engineering data or material properties, we simply double click on the engineering data, identify the material that we're using, and make sure that you can see column E here. If you can't see column E, you may need to move the window around a little, a little bit depending on your resolution because you want to be able to click on the box in column E to add the parameter, say for instance, the density to that parameter set. When we switch back to the project, open up the parameter set, confirm that we have uh, under those input parameters uh, the Young's modules and the density as we, as we desired. So that's our material properties. If we're looking for the mass or the volume of that system, uh, there's a couple of places we can look for it. You're going to find it under the properties box, whether you look at the total geometry or if you have individual uh, components inside that geometry, each one will have their own individual properties section. So if you wanted to, to map or basically track the, the mass and the volume of each one of these parts, you go to the individual part, specify that you'd like to track its mass by simply clicking on the button. You'll then see that in the output or in the output section of the parameter set. Working our way down, as we uh, mentioned a little while ago, uh, under the contact section, if we have a contact that, say for instance, is nonlinear, uh, we can uh, specify an offset treatment, that's our contact normal offset, and we have the ability to make that a parameter, the, uh, the CNOF value, for those of you who are familiar with uh, the real table items of the contact 174 element. On the mesh side, we're going to be defining uh, sizing controls, and as we mentioned, we always have the ability to make, to assign to a parameter these sizing controls. In this particular case, I'm going to create a sizing control uh, for my fillet face sizing in this location, that's my high stress region. But I also want to control the number of divisions around the circumference of that region. So I put a similar sizing control in there, one on edges, one on faces, and I'm going to make them both a parameter and then link them together inside of the parameter set. So the way that we do that is we return to the project page, 
we open up our parameter set and we'll find that we have these two mesh sizing controls located. Now, to make one parameter a function of another, uh, you need to know what the, what the input parameter expression is. So currently, my parameter P18 is assigned a value of 0 0.005 inches. If I want to make it equal to the value of P17, I simply come down to this window here, and I put in P17 as the, as the parameter that I would like it to be equal to. Uh, it is case sensitive, so make sure you use the capital P in that location. Uh, and you'll notice that once you've done that, this area of my parameter set is now grayed out because it's being controlled or it's now dependent on the P17 parameter. So you can limit the number of parameters that you need to, to concern yourself with when you start to build your table of design points by linking these together. Uh, you can also link these element sizings uh, to geometry parameters if you needed to do that. So I could make uh, this element sizing a function of, say, the radius OD in that particular area by, by following that same basic approach. Down to boundary conditions. Uh, again, to that remote force, we have the option to look at offsets. So in this particular case, we're assuming that there is a part, uh, uh, basically a Lego man's torso, which is going to be pressed down on the hip joint. And this may work for several different Lego man characters. So some may have broader shoulders than others. So when this is being pressed down, there may be a, a difference in the location at which, where that force is coming from or the moment that's being induced by the width of those shoulders. So we can uh, track that or basically control that magnitude of the force parametrically. We may want to look at the sensitivity or the, or the range of, of loads that could be applied to this. But we may also want to look at the sensitivity to the offset, the x, y offsets in this case. Uh, what if this load is moving inward or outward? How is that going to be, effect, be effective in the response? So by simply clicking on these, they then become input parameters to the system. And then down to our output parameters, uh, we've done a couple of things here. Uh, we're looking at the total deform, or in this case, the vertical deformation. I'd like to see how far this is bending downward. So in this case, I'm going to look at the uh, minimum value or the maximum negative value of that response uh, for, for deformation. Uh, I've got some stress that is scoped to the fillet region there. I want to track the maximum stress at that location. So I make sure that my scoping is what I need it to be. And then I tell it that I want to track the maximum value by clicking on that on that box to the left. And then lastly, I want to make sure that my force distribution is what I think it is. If I have a, a, an assembly, I want to make sure that all my connections are working properly. So I start by adding in a surface at the location that's going to pass through the, the location where I'd like to do my force summary. And then I scope a, a, uh, a reaction probe to a surface, specify the coordinate system that I'm referencing, and then the positive or negative side uh, of the response. Uh, when we've done that, we then have the option to go down and track the components, or in this case, just the total force that's being distributed through that region of the model. So when we return to the parameter set, we see that we now have these off offset values. We can uh, collapse our input parameters, and we now have offsets for the mass, vertical deformation, the stress, and then the vertical force through that boss. So once those are now in place, those parameters also get added to my table of design points. And this is something that, I, that I've uh, constructed already. Uh, and it gives you the opportunity to essentially hold certain parameters constant and vary others to look at the effect on that design response. Uh, if you want to reassign your, your design table, you can delete particular points that you're not interested in. Uh, you can come back right back up to the top. And let's say we wanted to look at the effect uh, of the uh, offset of that, um, of, of that load. So I've got my, in this particular case, my, my peg offset. Uh, I have a peg diameter. Uh, scrolling over a little bit here. Uh, we have our density, our Young's modulus. We can simply start to now put in values. Let's, let's say we want to look at an offset of 0.2. Uh, 0.25, you can see it starts to populate the table for you. Uh, so you can hold certain items constant to look at sensitivity to one parameter, or uh, you, can, you can edit these accordingly. Now, this is a table. So if you happen to have a table of design points predefined with something like Excel, you can simply paste those rows into this table, click on Update All Design Points, and it will generate um, the response for each one of these points. Now, as I mentioned earlier, when we look at the at the responses to the system, so let's go scroll over to the end here, 
when we look at the responses to uh, the mass, the vertical deformation, uh, the stress, and the force, we're only getting the maximum value for the scope region that we've specified. If we think that we want to go back and do more detailed post-processing uh, of that particular design point, you can keep it by clicking on the Retain button. When I click on that Retain button, it will then make a unique project file for that particular design point, and it'll have all of the analysis files there for me. It's essentially a copy of the mechanical environment with its own RST file for that particular design point. You can go back and you can post-process it uh, fully, as if you would a, a single point type of design. So that's the retain button. You know, be a little cautious with this because if you have a big model and you retain all of your design points, uh, you may find that you're filling up your disk. Uh, but if it's a, a fairly quick study and you're not too worried about the size uh, of the files, retain each one. Uh, take a look at your result response. Go back and view in more detail particular design points of interest and maybe refine further around that point. So let's take a look now at a couple of examples uh, for things that, that we can utilize this for. Uh, the first one that I'm going to show you is sensitivity to the location of that force. So let's open up our parameter set here, and we'll see that we have for our input parameters, uh, we're, we're varying the uh, remote force X and Y coordinate. Uh, then we look at the stress response with respect to that. Now we can then plot those quantities by using the charts. You simply double click on charts to add it to the parameter set. Uh, we can tell it that we would like to uh, define you know, one or two quantities for the x and y axis. So we'll start out by looking at the uh, force y coordinate, so moving that force upward or downward. And we'll compare that in this case to the equivalent stress in the boss region. And what we see here, now I've got one, two, three, four, five points. That's the same as my number of design points. But in, in several of these cases, uh, we kept the uh, remote force Y co uh, uh, coordinate a constant value. And so this column right here represents changes in the X coordinate. This uh, the points across the top, and we can click on the point to actually see which data point it represents. Uh, this is the effect across the top here, these three points, of varying the Y location of that force. So as you can see from my response, there's really nothing going on there. Nothing's changing. If I look at the X response in conjunction with that, so let's move, let's look at the effect of moving the X coordinate. So let's just uh, edit this to make it a different color. Scroll down to here. Make that the X red. Make it a little bit easier to see. Uh, line colors. Click on the right button. Okay, so there's our X coordinate. Let's make this guy a little bit brighter. Again, you just click on any one of these. Go to its uh, particular uh, area, click on that. So we've got our Y coordinate now in blue and our, and our X coordinate in red versus the stress in that location. You can see there's a fairly linear response. I ran a, a linear model here. Linear response to changes in that X direction, but there is essentially a constant or no response to changes in the Y direction. Well, well why is that? If I go back and look at my model and look at the way my remote force is being applied, uh, changing the location vertically doesn't affect the moment arm in this particular case with, small deformation, with a small deformation solution because my force direction is never changing. This might make me, make me think about for a moment, do I need to include something like large deformation in the problem? So as the part bends, do I need to have the direction of the load change, in which case it may be more sensitive to a, uh, to a change in, in the location of that force in that Y direction? So right off the bat, by simply running that, uh, that, linear, that purely linear analysis, it may tell me that I'm missing something here. And then I need to go back and, and refine my modeling approach, make sure that I don't have any large deformation effects uh, that are, that are uh, causing changes in the system. So very quick and easy way for you to evaluate results, make sure they make sense. If they don't, go back, revisit your model, and, uh, and make sure that you're, you're doing the best job that you can of emulating the particular situation that you're trying to am analyze. So let's say now, for the sake of argument, that we've identified a design point that uh, we think is optimum in this particular case for what we need to do. Now we need to be certain that the mesh that we're using, or the answer that we're getting for that point, is not mesh dependent. Right? Or the mesh is fine enough to capture uh, the fidelity of the system. So I'm going to make a copy of that project, and I'm going to do now a mesh refinement. So I basically uh, keep all of the other inputs constant for that particular design point, 
And now I go and I vary the element size in that location. And I track the von Mises stress in that location versus the element size. So this parameter set and parametric mesh controls make it very easy for you to quickly and effectively do a mesh refinement study. So what we're seeing here is as we increase the number of elements in the system, we're seeing a leveling off of the stress. Or we're getting to the point when we look at those stress values in the end of my column here, we're getting to a point where there's a negligible change in the stress as we add more elements. So at this point, we can say that we do not have a mesh-dependent solution, and, or, or another way of saying it is we have a converged stress solution for our particular mesh. If I'm down here and I'm seeing that my mesh is changing or my stress is changing dramatically as I go from one step to the next, I want to keep refining until I see this start to level off. So once again, typically what we would have to do traditionally was go in and do this manually, uh, track this ourselves. But now with the parametric mesh controls, it becomes very quick and effective for us to set up this study, uh, update all design points, come back when it's done in batch mode, and evaluate the response to make sure that we have enough elements.